Stay in the back. Well, I hope this works. Uh, it's on your sleeve. Oh, man, I see. I see. I wear this off on my sleeve here. Um, some of you may remember back about a year ago, I passed around this part of this project ahead, and I can pass this around now because can you, as you look at this, this is one of the plates from the amplifier. All right. And uh, this is an oxidophone amplifier. It was developed by Sir Charles Parsons back in 96. This is a perfect GoTech project because why would anybody build an amplifier of inferior quality of an obsolete technology when you go down and for two dollars you can get an amplifier that works better? I guess it's just because <coughs> I'm tested and I want to have fun. Yes, um, you can. <laughs> because it, because of the challenge is can we actually do it? Um, this is one of the plates, and I made the plates both out of aluminum. Something I knew not was not a good idea, but I did it anyway because I thought I could get away with it. Well, I couldn't get away with it. If you look at the plate that I'm going to pass around, you'll see why that I got galling and that created a real problem between us. So I replaced that plate with a nylotron plate and it made a big difference. Essentially, I have here, first of all, I want to thank GoTech for this project because without GoTech, I wouldn't have the amplifier that somebody contributed in one of the three giveaways. I wouldn't have known about the use of an electrodynamic shaker, which Bob Fulp suggested, and uh, I was able to get one donated to me by Data Physics Corporation, which was very nice of them in exchange for letting them know how this works for this particular unusual project. As some of you may remember, essentially an exetophone amplifier is a pure mechanical audio amplifier. And all audio amplifiers, in fact, all analog amplifiers of any kind essentially work on the principle of modulating some constantly flowing stream of something. For example, with vacuum tubes, you use electrons in the vacuum tube, and the grid cont controls whether those electrons flow or they don't. In the case of the exetophone amplifier, there are two plates, and we can, you can come up and look at this afterwards, that are meshed in such a way, they're about 12 thousandths off of each other, and air flows through it, and as these move, it modulates the air. Think of it as a controllable siren, essentially, in the way it works, although you never want the two plates to close completely, because that does what in vacuum tube or any, any regular audio amplifier would be calling clipping. It'll clip, and then you get a lot of distortion, and believe me, we've gotten a lot of distortion. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so I have down on the floor a regenerative mower. So that, mower. that hmm? modulates the sound. Is there that something else that, that creates the that, sound? That modulates the air. Modulates the airflow. And the air, in this case, in, the, in 1906, they attached this to a phonograph and they would put it on a phonograph record. In order to be able <laughs> to really test this, the shaker allows me to do this from any kind of audio source. And so I can go through all different frequencies and whatever. Ultimately, we want to use a diaphragm to activate this, more on this in a second, so that you can make essentially a completely mechanical PA system, essentially. Um, that was never able to be done by Sir Charles Parsons, and I suspect the reason he couldn't was because of excessive friction between the two plates. So, in any case, I'll start this up. And uh, the other thing I would comment on is, is that the sound is far better at the back of the room than at the front of the room, because some of the distortion, you're going to see that this is not very high fidelity. But, uh, but, uh, not CD quality. So not CD quality, it's CD quality. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you measured the frequency responses? Uh, I've done some crude checking of it, and it seems capable of going up quite nicely up to about 1500. Uh, and it may, in fact, be able to go higher than that. Let me make sure that everything. How loud is this going to be? Yeah. It's not that loud. Okay. I mean, eventually, I can make. I will should be able to make it very loud. So, is all the air flowing through these between these plates? It flows through the plates this way. This way. In other words, but all of it, not just part of it. Not part of it. I don't know if there's a mar here's a marker. If you look at, there is a plate <coughs> like one that's passed around like this. It's got slots. Okay, there's a second plate. If you look from the side, this is a plate, there's two plates like this. Slot, 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 slot. And there's a second plate with slots that match those. 
That second plate moves this way. And the, but the air is going through here and out. That's the right. Hole. That's right. It's exactly. Through, but so you'll get you'll hear the air when I turn this on. You'll hear the air, the blower. Before you start modulating it. Before you start, yeah. you'll hear the air. There'll, there'll be a kind of a rush of air. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's pretty quiet. Now well, then, let's uh, let's go back to 1908. So you have a CD in the player. There. I have a CD in the player. You're, you're modulating this with some actual music material. Yes, exactly. <laughs> This is a 1908 recording.
Not the pressure of airflow, it's the speed at which the plates move. I'll bring it up on sine wave, it doesn't work as well on sine wave. I've already learned a tremendous amount, and there's a guy over in England who's doing work with some of Charles Parsons' original machines, actually, a guy named Alex Kolkowski, and I've been in touch with him. Um, needless to say, I'm putting together some stuff for data physics as well. One of the things we've learned is that the, there are a number of limiting factors. Obviously, the more mass there is in what's moving back and forth, sure. the less response you're going to get at high frequency. The other problem with it is that in the original design, the plates actually touch, and I have reason to believe that we can get around this if we can make a very, very clever and very carefully made device that means suddenly we have to be very careful of our machine work, that the plate is essentially floating above it on pivots, on a parallel <coughs> and pivot. Mm -hmm. If we do that, and we do it right, we should be able to basically eliminate the friction entirely. If we can eliminate the friction entirely, I suspect that the quality of the sound will go up significantly. Similarly, if I put a proper exponential horn on this, and I actually own one that I built a few years ago, that should dramatically improve its performance because this horn is, is as, you, as you look at it, you can see it's really, it's sort of an approximation, but it really isn't. And the cutoff frequency of this horn is probably around six or 700 hertz. So, needless to say, the more I can do with making the horn better, the better it will be. Could you just epoxy the end of that thing onto a speaker cone? Not really. I mean, you're, you're trying, the whole purpose is to try to modulate the airflow. You see? Right, right, right. No, I'm saying instead of your, ex your expensive activator. device, your activator. Oh, I tried that first. And in fact, yes, you can. Uh, the first time I ran, I ran there. The problem with it was is that the sound from the speaker coming out uh, you made to it difficult the, for me to, you be able to perforate the most. Of the yeah, I get it. What sure. It was. What I, what I, more to the point, I'd like to be able to take that same device and then shield it right, and then use it as the. Once we get the, the more delicately built one built, I want to try doing it with that using no amplification, external amplification at all. Just use your mouth speaking into this thing, bring this to move. Oh, it should work. The other comment I would make about this is that there is actually a why to do this, and that is that if you, if you make this right, post-apocalyptic PA, you can make things <laughs> extremely powerful. I mean, in fact, you know there are versions of this that are used for, for testing in, in the industry that can produce up to 10,000 acoustic watts. So, you know, which is significant, far beyond what any normal amplifier could do. So. One of the things I'm doing is heading in the direction of trying to build more high power versions of it. You talked about the trying to reduce the friction of the two plates, and right. they're friction free, but don't you run into exactly the same problem again with the friction if you use too much air power? No, if, there, if, there's if, not, if there's too much if, air pressure? If they are, if they are balanced right, uh -huh. and that's a critical thing, if, this, if the bearings are good enough to hold it, Oh, it okay. won't matter. Mm -hmm. And remember, okay. we're still talking low pressure. I mean, we're, you're not talking more than five or six pounds of pressure. How about a flex church, huh? That's exactly what we want to use. Oh, what okay. Like yeah. The flex church. Flex, it, we, oh. We're using essentially what are called flexor bearings. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know. I think you're making that up. What, what about <laughs> using an air bearing? <laughs> if it gets, Nobody it, wants to describe that? It's got to be, it's very hard to hold it. Uh, it's very hard to hold it precisely in the right location. I mean, it would float then. <coughs> yeah, I mean, you know, certainly. You have a question? Magnus. Um, yes. So if you were actually going to, like, use this, like, you could probably use this if, like, for instance, like, if you were going to try and get the plates to go farther apart from each other, yeah. well, you could, you could, what if you use, like, magnets? You know, like, I actually, they have I actually thought about center. that. I actually thought about that. But it becomes a problem because as they lift off, then they're going to have to come up against something. 
right. and then you get friction on the backside. We've thought of using ball bear roll of bearings and ball bearings and stuff like that. I think Fletcher bearings are going to be the way to go. Yeah. <coughs> Sandwiches of Delrin, you know, uh, on you know, water cool it. Plates. You mean let them rub? Yeah. Well, that's so, what, what I've done here, essentially. Oh, okay. I've, got, I've got an aluminum plate here, and then I've got a piece of what's called myelotron, which is an, a, a lubricated bearing of material. Okay. And that, that seems, that made a huge <coughs> difference in the performance of the thing. You could use Babbitt and pour your own. Mm -hmm. Babbitt bearings and pour your own. Yeah, it's <coughs> both. And it'd be t appropriate technology for the age. Well, yeah. actually, what they used to be, and it's, it's incredible, I mean, you've seen that plate circulating around here. Parsons made the original ones using basswood and they cut the slots with the fret saw. And they were cutting slots that were smaller than the slots that I have here. It gives you a feeling for what people could do back then in terms of the quality of workmanship. So now, you had mentioned that you made that uh, plate out of aluminum. Right. Did you say you were going to do something different on that, or, or you weren't satisfied with aluminum, or you were? Well, one of the plates will continue to be aluminum. You, know, the, the light, the, you want the plate to be as light as possible. And so aluminum would be the thing to use. We're, we're, a friend of mine, Klaus Berner, is involved in this as well now. And we're going to start looking closely at the construction. One of the advantages of the way we're now designing it, and actually I do have some drawings I can show you to like people afterwards, um, is that the top of this will be open. On the, you can look down on the top of the plate, and then we can put windows in there. So you can actually look in and see the plates. So from an educational point of view, this is a purely mechanical demonstration of the concept of what an analog amplifier is. And for that reason, I think it might have possibilities as an exhibit or something that would like to People can actually see the relationship between contro a controlling signal, you know, mm -hmm. modulating a, a high power signal. Uh, and this is not a joke. Um, have you considered the Amish? True. Absolutely. There are a lot of uh, things that the Amish have adapted to be pneumatic. Yeah. Well, certain sects that you know will not use electricity. electricity. And they, they will use a pneumatic blender. <laughs> they will use a pneumatic whatever. This is a pneumatic sound amplifier. That's right. Yes. And and they also you know they also on acoustically recorded phonograph records can be played over this. So I'm thinking dance parties. Yeah. Get down. <laughs> Cut your your beard off. <laughs> I've had good luck building functions with a, a beryllium copper sheet that we've master cells. Yeah. You can get it in whatever thickness you want and it's it's bendable enough so you can make shapes, but springy enough so it actually functions as a reasonable spring. Oh, without think, joints, just as a well, bend. That's exactly yeah. exactly it. And the, the actually the bearings that I'm looking at, I just found them on. Isn't the isn't the internet wonderful? When you're building 196 What's the amp, internet? when you when you buy, when you're building 196 amplifiers, there's a type of bearing that's called a C flex bearing. And essentially you have um, I don't know if I can even draw this. There's like two pieces of thin material that are put together inside this barrel-like device. Yeah, it's and, it'll, and it allows it to rotate a certain number of degrees. And with what we're doing, in which we're planning to have this thing only move probably half a degree, it's only moving 25 thousandths back and forth. Is it translation or rotation? It's just, it's, it's just, it's slightly, it ro the bearings rotate this way, but they're tiny. And you can put them, you can use them as the pivot points of, of longer arms. Or you could just make the longer arm out of the Yes, really yes, that was our original design, actually. But yeah. in fact, You're just saying do this, right? This may be... And then slots are in here? Yeah. Yeah, you can just, you can just clamp it. Okay, guys, I'm going to... And then wiggle it back and forth? And then you just wiggle it? Digress in here. Yeah, yeah. I've got another long presentation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all so, very much. Let's